Now, I've got to admit, I had a bit of a chuckle last week when Facebook, as we all know, blocked the sharing of Australian news on its platform. And I got, I must say, quite a bit of schadenfreude out of it as well. You know, the same media class that defended Facebook's right as a private company to blackball Donald Trump and Craig Kelly, well, they suddenly complained that Facebook couldn't possibly ban the Sydney Morning Herald because it was a public utility. Go figure that one. Anyway, this week a deal was struck between the Australian government and Facebook and Aussie News is now welcome on Facebook's platform again. But whatever you think of the debate around the so-called news media bargaining code, and I'm no fan of it, the Facebook saga has thrown into sharp relief the power of big tech and made us all ask what we do about it. This week, IPA Director of Research and Spectator Australia contributor Daniel Wilde has written a very important piece on the threat big tech poses to freedom of speech and importantly, what we do about it. So let's hear his thoughts now. Joining me is the IPA's Director of Research and Spectator Australia regular, Daniel Wilde. Dan, thanks so much for coming on today. So let's talk about your piece in the Spectator Australia this weekend. And like a lot of people you've written about big tech censorship, we all know it's an issue. Uh, we all know it's a problem. We all don't like it, especially people on our side of politics because you know it's existential for us. Um, but you've drawn the distinction between censorship by the state and censorship by a private company. Now, they, they raise separate issues. So can you talk us through uh, that distinction? Yeah, sure, Gideon. So my article really focuses on some of the developments we've had over the last few years with the acceleration of censorship taking place by, you know, mostly big business and tech companies. So these are the phenomenon like deplatforming and shadow banning and issues like that, which many uh, listeners would be uh, familiar with. Now, on the right, we've typically focused on government censorship and public censorship and legal legal censorship of people, and with very good reason. So we have laws like Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, for example, that have a very significant chilling effect on freedom of speech. And so we've had that big issue with uh, public censorship, but the private side of things has grown over the last several years uh, as well. On top of that, I don't think it's an either or proposition. We now have an additional problem of private censorship yeah. on top of the public censorship as well. So, and look, the issue here is uh, it gets to what kind of country do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a society where basically uh, people aren't going to feel confident and comfortable in speaking their mind on important issues or issues that they uh, believe in very strongly? Israel Palau being an example. Yeah. Now, I don't share his particular uh, articulation or view of Christianity, but that's his view and I believe he should be free to express that view as an example. Uh, but we know that he was forced by his employer, Rugby Australia, to choose between his job and his religion, which is not something that any Australian uh, should have to no. uh, choose. It, it, it's, a, it's a real debate, but it always gets to me as to what we do about it. Now, it's been suggested that we should be regulating Facebook and stop them from doing this and regulating them like private utilities. Now, my concern among many is that once you start... Um, regulating Facebook, then you turn basically private sector censorship into potential government censorship because you know as well as I do that a future Labor government or the Democrats in the US or whoever else will start saying, okay, well, uh, now under these regulations, you have to kick hate speech off your platform. You have to kick climate denial off your platform. You have to kick uh, misinformation off your platform, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I might just take a step back to explain the context, which is, you know, traditionally on the right, we've viewed what a business does purely in terms of freedom of contract and freedom of association. So yeah. if you have a staff member and that staff member, say, put something out on social media that is arguably inconsistent with the values of an organisation or might be inconsistent with the clients or the customers of that organisation or even the other employees and that organisation, we might not like it, we might not like the uh, sensorial nature of a, of a business limiting speech, but recognise, well, at the end of the day, a business is responsible for its own reputation, you know, mm. and so an employee can damage the reputation of a business. And so we've tended to be more, well, uh, this is a, a matter of private contract and freedom of association, which, you know, I, I in large part agree with because a business needs to be able to control what goes on yeah. um, inside of its own operations and with its own staff. Uh, and, and that's before you get to, you know, um, religious schools, for example, and things like that. Like, you know, it cuts both ways, freedom of association and freedom of contract. It certainly does. And so I guess to your question about, well, if we're unhappy with what is happening, if we're unhappy with private enterprise uh, playing a key role in censoring debate and ideas, what do we do about it? And in my article, I uh, talk about two potential avenues for, for government 
uh, what government might do, um, not so much what I believe government should be doing, but the arguments that have been made by some on the right. Mm. One of those is to basically uh, make social media companies like Facebook liable for the content that is on their platform in the same way that a newspaper is liable for the content that is on their platform. Now, when I say liable, I mean they would be liable, for example, under defamation, defamation or if something was yeah. considered to be defamatory and they've published it. So um, that would be one approach, which is something that's more relevant in the US than Australia. But like I say, that's unlikely to solve the problem because the challenge we have here is selective censorship yeah. of opinion, which is a separate issue to companies being liable for what's on their platform. Mm. The other approach is to basically add something like political opinion or political belief as a protected attribute, which right. is the legal term that is used in anti-discrimination law in the same way that you know race, religion and gender is a protected attribute. And what that basically means in a nutshell is it would be illegal to discriminate against someone like fire someone or not serve a customer, for example, because of their political opinion or belief. But, you know, again, um, I understand that argument, but the issue is that, as we know, anti-discrimination laws almost always are used as a weapon rather than a shield. Correct. So what would ultimately happen is you'd have well-funded left-wing groups uh, using such a law um, against conservative organisations. It wouldn't really resolve the problem. So we get to this issue of, well, what can we do? Yeah. And my answer is we've just got to win the battle of ideas. Right it's, on. It's really it's, it's as simple and as difficult as that. It's, <laughs> the only choice we have is to get into the debate and there's a great debate going on about the future of our culture and the future of our way of life. And we have to win that debate because if we lose that debate, we're, there's not going to be any way of, of being protected. Yeah, that, that's a, a great message and a great take home that we just have to double down and fight harder and we have to outsmart these algorithms we have to outsmart big tech we have to beat them at their own game uh, i know building your own platform is sort of a, a cliched reply and it's a little bit unrealistic in a few senses but uh you know we, we're used to getting through gatekeepers before newspaper editors uh you know tv producers uh we can do it again but you know i think that's a, a really important call to rally so turning uh, taking off your spectator australia hat and putting on your ipa uh, research director hat, um, there was a cracking piece of research that we put out at the IPA this week. Can you talk us through uh, the latest uh, volley in the climate front? Sure. So uh, this was the handiwork of our outstanding researcher, Kian Hussey, who went through mm, all the data that's out there on emissions around the world and produced uh, some very compelling statistics and analysis, uh, one of which was showing that uh, every two weeks, China emits as much carbon as Australia does in one entire year. And the purpose of that stat is really to put this debate into context, which is Australia only makes a very minuscule contribution to the overall uh, volume of carbon emissions around the world. And regardless of what your views are on the science of climate change or the particular policy approach should be taken in relation to emissions and carbon, uh, climate change and, and carbon, uh, we have to contend with the reality that China is the single largest emitter in the world. Yep. Uh, Australia accounts for only about 1.1% of global uh, emissions. And so there's no, there's no gain there. There's no mm. gain in terms of any kind of discernible environmental benefit. Again, putting the science to one side, there's a great big debate on the science. Yeah. But even if we accept uh, the, the establishment view of the science, it still doesn't follow that we should be doing anything in particular about our emissions. So uh, there's, no, there's no discernible environmental benefit, but there is a big hit there is a big cost, and that cost is real. Mm. You know, these are people's jobs under Correct. a net zero emissions target that are going to be hit. We had some research out a couple of weeks ago showing that up to 653,000 jobs would be put at risk by net zero emissions. Now, just finally, and I appreciate this is a question without notice, but you and I talk a lot about US politics around the IPA water cooler. Uh, 2024, who's your pick? Quick. Trump. Trump. <laughs> Trump. Uh, well, Which one? It's... Which it's one? Trump's party. It's still Trump's party, and there's a lot to happen between now and then. Um, Trump will be the kingmaker yep. uh, for the foreseeable future. There's some rumours that he might run for Congress and try and make a bid for the speakership. So cool. but look, ultimately, Trump will, will be uh, either, if he doesn't run himself, the candidate that he endorses is likely to be the prevailing nominee. I think I think what you meant to say is a Trump. It could be Ivanka, could be Don Jr. Could be <laughs> Tiffany. I'm a bit of a Tiffany fan. Well, there's a lot of them. It, it's fascinating to watch Trump because he's like, he's like a coiled spring. You know <laughs> something's going to happen, but it, 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 you just don't know what it is, and we're all sort of uh, waiting. But anyway, uh, plenty more discussion to be had on that. Maybe your next piece in The Spectator might be a US... Uh, Spectator Australia might be a US... Uh, 
politics, please. Very good idea. Very good idea. Gideon. Yeah. Well, thank you, great man, and uh, thanks for coming on Counterculture and Spectator Australia TV. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Gideon. And a reminder: if you want to uh, support the Institute of Public Affairs in putting out great research like that, explaining what there is to lose in terms of going along with this climate madness, please, please go to our website, check out what we do, and consider becoming a member of the IPA that allows myself and Dan Wilde to do the research uh, and, and, uh, and, and the commentary in the public domain that we do. And that can all be found at ipa.org.au.